I am going to share somebody else speaking as part of this um, reflection on heaven. Um, perhaps we can just have, just have a moment of silence before we start as well, just to gather ourselves. <laughs> Pray to God, thank you for this time we can have together just to reflect. Uh, I just ask for your um, guidance that you'd lead us into deeper truth through our sharing, our thinking and our praying. Amen. So I've been thinking about heaven, um, which is probably a bit counterintuitive, isn't it? <laughs> Those of us who are fighting to save our earth, you know. Um, isn't heaven really part of the problem, uh, we could say, which is a particular theology or a version of Christianity that's had very little regard for the earth, uh, where the focus has been um, too much about heaven. And, um, and we haven't had this understanding of creation at the heart of salvation. So, you know, probably many of you are aware of those kinds of theologies that have been really, really unhelpful to us. But maybe as a result, we've kind of pushed heaven sort of somewhere out. We don't really know what to do with heaven anymore. We kind of push it into the background. And um, and I've been wondering about whether we sort of need maybe a fresh imagination about heaven. Um, so I think our culture lives in what Charles Taylor, who's a sociologist, he wrote a massive book uh, called A Secular Age. But I think our culture lives in what we could call is the, that, this is me trying to do it with my hands, <laughs> the imminent frame. So the imminent frame. And what that imminent means really that which is now present. And in a sense, it's almost like the doors to heaven in our culture are firmly shut. You know, we, we, we no longer have a culture that you could say is open to the transcendent, to that which is beyond. It's in our material world, even within a lot of our spirituality, the end that we've shifted so far from the transcendent that everything now exists in this imminent box. And uh, Charles Taylor describes the process of how over 500 years since the Reformation, he sort of talks about this process whereby in some ways, God just got further and further removed from earth to the point where, uh, you know, our society kind of said, well, what is this fiction, this man, with a white beard who sits on a throne somewhere in the far distant uh, somehow doesn't seem to have a lot to do uh, with our material reality. And so in a sense, it was very natural for modernity to, to shed this idea of God in heaven altogether. Why do we need that? You know, we've got science, we've got technology, we've got industrialization. We're on this massive project uh, in a way to create heaven on earth. You know, we're doing it. What on earth do we need? heaven we don't need heaven so in a sense you could say this is the story of our times really that we're busy uh, making paradise on earth with our science and our technology um, and all of our incredible uh, abilities to control and manipulate the natural world to our ends this is the great project that we've been on for the past 300 plus years um, and part of what's got me thinking about heaven is I listened to um, a talk and it was given at the opening of an event um, which is called uh, Black Elephant and um, a recent event. And it was talks, short lectures uh, based around the hidden gems behind despair. And Claire Farrell from Extinct Rebellion is also one of the speakers. I, I recommend her talk as well. But this philosopher um, who is his parents, I think, were from Algeria, but he's led a very nomadic existence, I've been a refugee in many ways, um, has lived in America, Paris, Kuwait. Um, he gave this talk and it really, really struck me because he um, he's kind of, um, so what I thought I'd do is originally I was gonna read his words and I thought, no, no, I think I'm going to get him to speak and then I will pause the video. So I'm just going to share screen. Um, and hopefully uh, play you. Can everyone see that? Can everyone see the screen? Yeah, great. Okay, so I'm going to play you a bit of him. This is him uh, here. 
Uh, so I'm going to play you a bit of his talk, then I'm going to pause and speak a bit, and then I'm going to play a bit more. So this is him um, speaking, and he's talking here about um, what modernity means, and he's talking about this uh, concept of secularization. So a bit what I just described from Charles Taylor, this is what he's talking about. He's talking about how modernity is defined by this concept of secularization. Okay, what about this? these interactions and how you think about it, right? So of course, I, you know, when you talk about oil, when you talk about fossil fuels and so on and so forth, the first thing you encounter, and this is how I would like to talk about despair at some point, um, um, is of course this big, big, big notion of the Anthropocene, right? Which supposedly would be the name of the world we're living in, which maybe is a world which is, you know, starting to uh, uh, come to an end, right? Um, Anthropocene, as you know, has been criticized by many scholars uh, because it was, you know, abstract, basically. It's not only humanity as if, you know, everybody had the same sort of responsibility in, in, in the making of climate change, as if humanity existed whatsoever. And, you know, most of my friends on the left, sometimes not on the left, said, well, 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 you know, this is all about capitalism, we know what it is, da, 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 or no, no, this is all about colonialism and so on and so forth. But, you know, one thing that you could be, you know, certain of is that something emerged that we call climate change since modern times, right, modernity. And one of the ways in which one can characterize modernity is secularization. And I would like to talk about this now. We know, or at least people say, that modernity, whatever that means, has created the conditions of climate change, right? Modernity has led to the Anthropocene. To some extent, modernity is the Anthropocene. But if modernity cannot be explained without the concept of secularization, then why don't we ask the question, how did secularization led to climate change? In other words, is there not an Anthropocene, but a secularocene? So what is it, secularization? Well, the first meaning of the word, which seems a bit technical, but in fact, isn't that much, is the action via which the state expropriates goods from the churches in a Western context to make it its own, right? But more generally, it means the ways in which something which was supposedly sacred becomes profane, or more precisely, maybe, the ways in which, no matter how secular we think we are, there is always something about heaven which is at stake in the ways in which we were hoping to achieve freedom, happiness, via growth, and on earth. Let me put it in another way. It means that at some point, probably during the 19th century, something happened, which is that all the things that we supposedly, and we here means humanity for sure, that we imagine as an otherworldly reality, which is precisely what heaven also means, or heavens, not only paradise, but what is supposed to exist somewhere else in another world, transcendent, well, the problem with this heaven is that it was not abolished. It was taken and it was transferred on earth with the assumption that it was possible to actually achieve heaven, absolute salvation, absolute freedom on earth. But the problem is that the earth never asked to carry the burden of heaven. And when the earth was supposed to carry the burden of heaven, earth did not remain the same because the earth was transformed. 
via exploitation of land, of people, and the exploitation of the subsoils. So it means that the critique of heaven has overturned the earth itself. So I'm just going to press pause there. I think that's quite a big thing that he's saying. He's kind of saying basically when human beings try to bring heaven on earth, it sort of goes badly wrong. There's something about when we abandon heaven, um, we don't also let go of heaven, <laughs> but we're trying to do it uh, in a way, um, in a way that becomes quite dangerous. And it's interesting that other words that people have used, he uses secular scene. Other people I've read, some down a writer recently uses the word hubris scene, the idea of pride, that we're living in the age of human, sort of this immense um, vision of ourselves as like God on earth. You know, this is the this is the roots of the crisis that we're in. But somehow when we try to create heaven on earth, we end up creating hell on earth. So I'm just going to carry on for a bit longer. Um, Now, some of you may think what this happened. Kathy. Oh, I just, <clears throat> I just was really interested in what he just said about, he said that the state kind of took things from the church. Yeah. Actually, like if you go further back and read like Jason Hickle, Less Is More and some of the growth stuff, the church nicked loads of stuff from the common people. <laughs> So I just wanted to put that in yeah. and just I think that was quite interesting what he said. I don't, you know, we sort of need to unravel more what he meant by that. I was mm -hmm. thinking, did he mean when the monasteries were taken over? Or I, I don't know quite what he means by that, but I do agree it's a little bit. Anyway, I'll just continue for now, but I do agree there's kind of questions as to what that exactly means. Has to do with the real problem. Well, as soon as you try and define what is real, in what is unreal, you're already part of the problem. Because as soon as you say that here, what you're seeing, what is visible, what is material is real, and what is not material, not visible, is not real, you're doing what is called metaphysics. Because you're presupposing that something is real and something is not real, something that science can never tell you, something that philosophers who talk about science can tell you, but as philosophers, they're doing metaphysics. At some point, people talk about respecting or protecting the environment or nature, physis in Greek. But you know, most, if not all, the non-human entities, such as mountains, lakes, when they're recognized, juridically, as juridical persons precisely, and therefore are granted rights, it's not only their physical properties which are concerned and recognized, it's also their metaphysical properties which are recognized. So there is no such thing as a respect of nature without the mediation of something which belongs to otherworldliness and metaphysics. Now you're going to say, well, 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 I'm not convinced. But in fact, this is already the case whether you like it or not. And I'm going to say why. In fact, the ecological debate is already a theological and religious debate. Why? So again, I'm going to press pause. And I recommend that you go back and listen to this. It's only 18 minutes long, but I'm not going to play the whole thing. But he goes into touching how... Um, he understands the ecological issue and various ways in which it is metaphysical in, at its very core. I think it's interesting when he talks about mountains and lakes as having a sacred aspect. I don't know if you know, but the River Ouse in Sussex, uh, there was a bit in The Guardian that said it may be the first in England to be given legal rights of itself. Um, whether that will be seen in a sacred sense, I don't know. But it is often the case that the things that are protected are often done so because there is an indigenous culture that has a very metaphysical sacred grasp of creation. And that's why those things are given particular protection where there is still an embedded metaphysical worldview. 
Whereas in our modern worldview, that's all been stripped out. So we have no reason, we don't have a concept of sacred sites that need to be protected uh, in the same way. Um, so I'm just going to play the very end of it uh, where he just sums up um, why he thinks this gives us a reason to take us beyond despair. Um, having talked about the very end of world nature of this crisis, so I'm just going to go to, I'm um, gonna fast forward a little bit. Um, of not giving conservative Obviously, political religious yeah, forces, of not right. giving them the monopoly <laughs> of the spiritual and of metaphysics. Now, the last thing I would like to say about precisely despair is that the state in which we are comes from the fact that or at least I would like to, you know, talk about that tentatively, has to do with the fact that precisely what we used to call heaven on earth, under the figures of growth, under the figures of development, under the figure of infinite progress towards what? Infinite growth? Well, we know that it's impossible because resources are finite. Well, precisely the loss of this kind of hope, which is a very historically situated hope, the crisis of this hope engenders a form of despair, which in a way means that the earth is now able to be the earth without, you know, carrying the burden of heaven. Thank you very much. <laughs> Have I stopped sharing? Yeah. Yeah, right, let's put that away. So I'm just going to read out those words again right at the end, because what he's saying is, is that because we've lost this vision of heaven, of progress, infinite growth, because that storyline is effectively not working anymore, uh, then what he's saying is, is precisely the loss of this story of hope, the story of hope that modernity's had, engenders um, actually, which is a kind of despair, it's the kind of despair that our modern world is in, in some ways. How do we, re how do we reconceive the future? We have a real crisis in terms of a vision of the future at the moment, how we can even see it. But he says that letting go of this vision, this idea of heaven on earth, means that the earth is now able to be the earth without carrying the burden of heaven. So when modernity gives up its illusions of a kind of imminent heaven, the heaven of the humanity creates by itself, the earth is able again to be the earth. Um, I think that's really interesting. Now, we're not there totally yet in our culture by any means. We know that there are many still pursuing infinite growth. So, you know, it's not that that is a agreed upon reality, <laughs> but there are many people who now deeply, deeply question it. And they just say it's just broken. It's not working. So we're in this weird time where we've got different stories going on together. But I just thought it's really interesting if he's saying that we need to let go of heaven to let the earth be earth, what, where does that place us as Christians? Do we still need heaven? And if so, how does heaven help us uh, in our activism, in our desire to restore and save the earth? So that's the question I'm asking really. Uh, do we need heaven? Do we need heaven as Christians? And if we do, do, can that concept help us? So I thought what I would like to do is try and just let you have a little chat about that.